Enron used to be the seventh largest corporation in the United States, which is now a startling fact. They transformed commerce as well as the energy market. They were significantly more intelligent than their rivals, and their company was sophisticated and difficult for the common individual to comprehend. However, in actuality, it was a huge hoax that involved political manipulation, fraud, dishonesty, and lying. The largest fraud in U.S. history was Enron. The hoax has significant after-effects, a very public exhibition of corporate greed that shone right into the heart of corporate America was unveiled, along with billions of dollars stolen, dozens of convictions, one suicide, and thousands of lost jobs. This is the story of how one company took 10 years to grow $60 billion in value and then in less than a month go bankrupt. This is the tragic story of Enron. Enron started out as a natural gas-focused energy supplier. The firm eventually expanded into trading, striking energy deals with utilities, switching to the internet, and even trading the weather. They were the darlings of Wall Street, the business that was unstoppable, with annual stock price increases. Additionally, the business had strong political ties. The George W. Bush campaign received the most funding from Enron alone. Bush even referred to the creator of Enron, Kenneth Lay, as Kenny Boy. And it was with Kenny Boy that the narrative starts. The father of Kenneth, a poor Baptist priest, raised him. The young Ken often thought about his future and how he may be able to change his present circumstances. He rose to prominence in the deregulation of the energy industry as a young man. Before rising through the ranks and developing a personal relationship with George Bush Sr., the Ph.D. graduate worked as a financial analyst in the Pentagon. To transport George Sr. and his wife to their son's inauguration, Ken Lay would even send an Enron private jet. Later on, you'll learn that these favors were not unpaid. The 1987 Valhalla Affair served as the first warning sign to business founder Kenneth Lay that something was awry within the organization. Two oil traders who worked for Enron engaged in extensive gambling, while moving funds to fictitious accounts with amusing but dubious names. Concerned auditors reported that they had discovered two traders falsifying earnings, shifting money into their accounts, and engaging in excessive trading. Lay did not fire the two traders and remained the same. As long as they were generating revenue for the business, it didn't seem to matter to him what they were doing. Enron even wrote a letter to them, requesting that they keep producing millions for them. The two were later found guilty of fraud. Ken Lay pretended to be astonished and said he was ignorant of their careless gambling and stealing, but as it was eventually discovered, he encouraged it. One of the traders who was found guilty was sentenced to a year in prison, which caused Ken Lay a lot of trouble. He needed a new source of income because one of his primary income generators was now imprisoned. Lay's greatest asset was Enron's new CEO, Skilling. He began steering Enron on a new path as soon as he joined the business. Skilling planned to transform Enron from a gas distribution business into a natural gas stock exchange. Additionally, he introduced the business to the concept of market accounting, which would have allowed it to steal billions. Therefore, market-to-market -market accounting just enables the business to record earnings in its books on the day the agreement was signed. As a result, Enron could record $50 million in their books on the day they signed a contract for $50 million over the following 10 years. Even if the contract went through, it didn't matter because they wouldn't get paid a thing. As a result, the company's value on paper was overstated. Deals were frequently arbitrary, and Enron could assign any value to them. The office rejoiced when the Security and Exchange Commission accepted Enron's accounting ruse of market-to-market. They were aware of the importance of this to generating billions. In the meanwhile, Skilling was well known for his survival of the fittest Darwinian theory. His favorite book, The Selfish Gene, explains how human nature is driven by greed and competitiveness. Skilling wanted his staff at Enron to be able to use their intuition. He achieved this, among other things, by rating each employee on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being the best and 5 being the worst. The problem was that 10% of all employees had to receive a 5-star rating. When your grade reached 5, you were let go. As a result, Skilling finally found the thrilling competition he was seeking for. P. 
people started working 18 hours a day and were merciless in their attempts to make as much money as they could for the corporation. Famously, Skilling asserted that individuals are exclusively driven by money. Risk-taker Skilling frequently embarked on exhilarating escapades with other Enron executives. Skilling preferred people with a little bit of edge, which was the reason. Lou Pai, a polite businessman, possessed this kind of quick thinking and insight. Lou Pai was referred to be Skilling's intercontinental ballistic missile. He appeared to be driven by two things, money and strippers, when he was the CEO of an Enron subsidiary. Pai isn't as enigmatic as one might think in such a significant affair. With $215 million, he departed in 2011 and rose to the position of the second largest landowner in Colorado. He abandoned his company division with $1 billion in damages while largely escaping with his life. A few decades after the dust settled, Pi would return to the story. In just two years, the value of Enron shares had quadrupled. Everyone who had some extra money was participating in the stock market game. Enron understood that the stock price would continue to increase as long as the firm fulfilled or surpassed all expectations. And they always managed to outperform expectations. At this time, Skilling encouraged his employees to invest more of their 401ks in Enron while speaking to them at the corporate convention. He was aware that the earnings were actually shifting the other way. They were losing billions of dollars on natural gas projects all over the world. Enron had invested enormous sums of money in facilities in India, but that country couldn't afford to pay for the power. Despite the fact that the site was in ruins, Enron's leaders continued to record and project revenues for the projects in their books and give themselves hefty bonuses. The analysts, who were in charge of halting the wrongdoing, were seduced by skilling. After receiving some dot-com inspiration, the startup quickly started selling bandwidth. Blockbuster signed an agreement with them to offer streaming services, but the technology wasn't yet ready. Although the purchase was successful, Enron nonetheless recorded a $53 million loss. Things quickly got out of hand, and Enron started selling weather. They would begin wagering on the weather's forecast. You might think of it as shady, but it was operations like these that led Enron to be listed on the Fortune 500's most innovative companies list. One reporter at Fortune would start asking questions, and this would later lead to the company's demise. Reporter Bethany McLean was writing on Enron. She quizzed Skilling on a few straightforward topics, such as how exactly Enron generated its money. Skilling did not respond and instead assigned his CFO to do so the following day. They spent three hours studying the paperwork while sitting in the office. At the conclusion, the CFO urged the reporter to avoid casting the firm in a negative light. The CFO, Andy Foster, was the one who made Enron's debts vanish by making the company seem successful on paper. He created a fictitious company called LJM to purchase Enron assets. Even 96 bankers were duped into contributing to the LJM fraud by him. They contributed to Enron's accounting fraud, which ultimately led to the majority of them being imprisoned. Now that the founders were looking for something fresh, they focused their attention on California. As Skilling began to stutter, he insulted investors over the phone. Resulting from the failed companies, the corporation was struggling to meet its quarterly goals. Enron joined Pacific Gas and Electric, gaining access to the California grid as a result. Rolling blackouts became typical in California's newly deregulated market, but oddly, the state had doubled the capacity than the demand. What caused it then? The traders at Enron were, it turns out, manipulating the market. When the price rose high enough, they would bring the power back in. They were transporting electricity out of state to boost demand. They also phoned the power plants and requested justifications for a brief outage while raising the cost. The power to move the energy was in the authority of the traders. They were skilled at extracting every last cent from Californians. Statewide blackouts had a terrible toll on Californians' lives. The state of California spent $30 billion over this 365-day experience. Bush, the president, did not halt it either because of his strong relationship with Ken Lay. Additionally, the Federal Energy Regulating Commission resisted intervening until the Senate compelled them to. The chairman of the commission was personally recommended by Lay. This whole ordeal caused the people of California to turn on their governor and appoint a new one. 
2001 saw Skilling's abrupt resignation. He could have been afraid that if he left the firm years before it collapsed, he would be able to pretend that everything was okay. Ken Lay assumed the position of CEO. One day later, Sharon Watkins, the company's chief financial officer, wrote to Lay to inform him of the extent of the fraud and corruption she had just discovered. SEC started a non-public investigation. Investors started to get anxious. While the accounting company for Enron was busily destroying records, Lay sought to calm them down. On October 23rd, one of the accounting companies destroyed one ton of paper. It was too late, though. The walls had started to scream. The business went from having a strong reputation as one of the top investors to being completely insolvent. The market was frozen at the $32 level for the thousands of people who had Enron stocks. And when it was reopened, it was at $9 per share. Executives at Enron had a fire sale of all their stock in the meanwhile. In the months before filing for bankruptcy, Skilling instructed his staff to purchase additional shares while he sold all of his own. Criminal investigations were started when the topic started to gain traction in the media. When summoned to testify, Baxter Codd instead got into his Mercedes, drove down a quiet neighborhood, and opened fire on himself. Andy Foster entered a plea of guilty to the charge of wire fraud. He revealed himself in order to make a bargain for himself. He received a 10-year sentence but only served six and paid $23 million in penalties. The accounting company Anderson was found guilty of impeding justice. Due to reputational damage, the oldest accounting business in America filed for bankruptcy. Jobs were lost by 29,000 persons. Ken Lay made $300 million from Enron. He was found guilty of 10 charges of securities fraud and was sentenced to 45 years in jail when he passed away from a heart attack one month later. 20,000 individuals lost their employment, their health insurance, and only received an average of $4,500 in severance money. During the bankruptcy, executives received $55 million. On 19 counts of security and wire fraud, Skilling was found guilty. He received a 24-year sentence. He spent only 12 years in prison before his kid and parents both died. Skilling wishes he might be given another opportunity. In 2019, Skilling was appointed manager of a brand new business that he created a few years prior. Former CEO Lou Pai, who retired into the sunset, is assisting Skilling in regaining ties and funds. The Wall Street newspaper reports that Skilling is talking with former executives to launch a new company. Skilling cannot serve as an executive of any publicly traded firm, according to the SEC. So that is the thrilling story of Enron with a twisted ending. So many people were unemployed, lost billions, and the executives reaped millions from this huge fraud. Skilling's eagerness after his release to enter the business world again makes us question corporate greed and how the privileged seem to get away with all of this, whereas those who face the blow might not even have recovered after 20 years. What do you have to say about the corporate greed and lust rampant in the capitalist world? Do mention your opinions in the comments section below. Don't forget to like our video and leave a thumbs up as it motivates us to bring new and amazing content for you. Till next time, see you.